You're listening to the Deep Purple Podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. Welcome to the Deep Purple Podcast, the first and only podcast devoted to one of the greatest bands in rock history, Deep Purple. Today's episode is episode number 64, Deep Purple and Van Halen. And coming to you from the suburbs of Chicago, I'm your host, Nathan Beaudry. And coming to you from the Providence area, your co-host, John, Big Blue Bug Matola. <laughs> well, that was a good one. Yeah. All right, so we've got with us this week a very special guest, Mr. Greg Renoff, author of, among other things, Van Halen Rising, this incredible book, which I will gush about a little bit later, um, how a Southern California backyard party band saved heavy metal, and also a new book, right? You've got a new book that came out fairly recently, right? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, it's uh, on uh, record producer Ted Templeman who produced the first six Van Halen records and the Doobie Brothers and Little Feet and a number of other bands along the way and uh, tracks his, his life from uh, his childhood up through, uh, yeah, the uh, end of his years at Warner Brothers. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, you kind of skipped over that. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this week. It's really yeah. awesome to have a, a guest on the show, especially someone of, of your stature. And I've got to say, um, just reading through this book, um, I've, you know, especially recently with the show have read so many books about rock bands and this one I really think stands out as being um, not only extremely well written but very well researched Um, looking through your notes at the end of the book I was kind of floored about how many um, like almost over seven how many guitar magazines I own (laughs) yeah over 700 little references but yeah meticulously cataloged all the things that you um cited not 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 to mention i can't even count up how many interviews these this is but it's got to be what 100 150 interviews easy yeah it was more than that but yeah there were a lot i it it was a a labor of love that sort of snowballed into a book so yeah thank you for saying all that and it was uh it was a uh a burning a burning passion for me to to kind of put that story together so it it, it was uh, also something i really felt like I wanted to do do right, and uh, I am uh, just pleased to hear you liked it so much. Thank you. Yeah, and I, as somebody who you know is very familiar with Van Halen, but definitely by no means an expert, or um, it it was just every page was learning like ten new things about Van Halen that I never knew before. And um, obviously, everybody knows. And growing up, when we grew up, uh, how influential Eddie Van Halen was, and the, the band, and how you know that was that that era of rock gods that i grew up with all worshiped eddie van halen and seeing the beginnings of uh, of where they came from it's kind of really the way you tell the story is very uh funny it's like there's a lot of humor in the way that you're telling the story about how david lee roth joined and all that and um yeah it's just very it's it's really a page turner and i I definitely recommend to anybody um whether you're a huge van halen fan or just getting into them it's it's something you definitely want to pick up and you got some names giving you some props on this book too. You know, you've got uh, right on Chuck Klosterman on the cover, Ted Templeman on the back, Martha Quinn. Was, you know. Yeah, well, you know, Martha Quinn. That was like the that was like the, the dream come true, right? It was like I was like, really, you'll blur my book? I mean, yeah, the, yeah. Those other guys are great too, but you know, it's like Martha Quinn. So I was like, you know, it goes yeah, without you... saying. It was she was a uh, she's she's a huge. In all seriousness, she's a huge Van Halen fan. So that was actually really great i had thought of her and i you know i didn't know whether she'd be interested or not but she was like oh my yeah she'd love love the book but she's that's like in her top two or three bands are van halen so that's uh yeah she was always like the the, the stealth van halen fan i think behind the scenes not really stealth but she was always like maybe like pushing behind the scene for like play more van halen you know she was really really great and uh in uh enthusiasm about the book so that was awesome yeah Awesome. So we had just kind of talked a little bit on Twitter, uh, kind of back and forth. We've been talking for a while just about various things and, you know, uh, sort of the connections there are between Van Halen and Deep Purple. And we thought, hey, it'd be fun to just have a little chat about some of the things that we've been 
uh, batting around back and forth. Um, and before we get into some of that, uh, we would like to thank our patrons who make this show possible. Um, of course, if you want to become a patron yourself, very easy to find us on Patreon. There's a link in the show notes and you can donate as well. Um, coming in at the $20 tier, Ryan is still unnamed, I believe. We've got Ryan. Yet. We don't, I don't think we came up with a name for it. Did we All right, up? we got to get on that. Yeah, we got to think of something <laughs> clever. I mean, we called our show the Deep Purple Podcast, so it might take us a while to think of something clever. Um, the $20 tier, Ryan M. At the $15 highball shooter tier, we have Steve Seaborg. Uh, but he is coming in on PayPal now. Did I mention that in the last episode? Yeah. Yeah, he's coming yeah, in because we were joking about how <laughs> nobody wanted to use PayPal. And then finally, yeah, finally he's, mercifully he's coming in. did. <laughs> and actually, I got contacted by someone else today who wants to use PayPal because they don't like the taxes. A new person, actually, but they don't want the new tax thing that Patreon's doing. We've All got right. at the Turn It Up to $11 tier, Alan Ain't Too Proud to Beg. At the $10 No One Came tier, still no one. The $5 Money Lender tier, Clay Wambacher, Greg Sealby, Frank Teelgard, Mortensen, Mike Knowles. The $3 Nobody's Perfect tier, Peter Gardo, Ian DeRosier, Mark Roback, and Anton Glaving. And at the $1 Made Up Name tier, Els Murders, Spacey Noodles, The Ghastly Leaky Mausoleum, and of course, Michael Vader. And then we always thank our brothers at the Deep Dive Podcast Network, Riot Sabbath Bloody Podcast, The Simple Man is Skinner Reconsidered, Terry T-Bone Mathley, T-Bone's Prime Cuts, and of course, someone that Greg is very familiar with, Jorg Planer, the yeah. essential Twitter follower, <laughs> god of all things White Snake. So thank you to all of you for all your support. And um, mm. yeah, Jorg has been very good to our show. And Great I know he's been resource. Yeah, he's he's just like, yeah, he's it's unbelievable. And he, whether you know whether you're asking him for help or or not, he'll he'll tell you if you got some detail wrong, which I do on a daily basis. <laughs> I'll get some date wrong or something, and he'll be like, "Well, here's this," and could not be a nicer guy about you know he's not just he's not uh saying, "Hey, you dummy, you got this wrong." He'll just yeah, yeah. Like, he'll be like, "Here's an article from 1972 that shows that," and you know, "Oh, thanks." Appreciate I like that. to think that if he was working with the show, he wouldn't call you a. Dummy. <laughs> call you a dummy he'd just be like i'm out of here if you yeah like exactly I, i'm i'm blocking these idiots they don't know what they're talking about. i'm not working with this dumbass <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so uh so obviously you've got these great books uh, i mean i guess do you want to just start off greg and tell us a little bit about um uh before we get into the deep purple connection what uh what what was your entry point into Van Halen? What got you really obsessed with them? And uh, you, you said this was a labor of love and it really shows that this is not something you just said, oh, I'm going to throw this together to, to sell a book. This is unbelievably well-researched. So what was your entry point? Um, yeah. So my entry point was, was uh, 1984. I think like a lot of kids who uh, saw a jump on MTV. I was 14 at the time. And that really, really captured my imagination. I mean, I, I'd been watching MTV for a while, but for whatever reason, the, the jump video just, well, for whatever reason, because it was Van Halen kind of stuck out because it was, it sort of, uh, was, seemed different to me than a lot of other, uh, videos at the time. I think the way they, the, the, the video was put together with the kind of Roth, you know, kind of sticking his head up into the camera and the backflips and all the, just the whole, the whole Van Halen vibe really mm -hmm. came through and kind of, uh, immediately, uh, grabbed me i saw van halen that tour and uh you know after that it was uh for me was was always one of my my top bands but i actually started playing i, I start, probably started playing guitar a little bit before that but after the seeing van halen and uh being a person who had already started playing guitar i, I tried to improve and you know uh was became a guitar player who liked van halen but even though i never was a very good guitar player but you know, along the same lines, that was really, for me, my entryway into a lot of heavier guitar stuff. I had been introduced early on to some stuff like, you know, Almond Brothers. Um, I had heard Black Sabbath. I had heard Rush. But there was never something where it was constantly fed to me. It was basically I, I heard it. And then after I, I, I uh, got into Van Halen, you get to start buying Circus Magazine and all, all that stuff. You sort of, you know, you sort of have that genre in your, you know, in your, on your radar and all these other bands and listening to Zeppelin more and that type of stuff. I really, from playing guitar and being interested in rock music, that really kind of shifted my taste much more directly to sort of heavier, heavier music. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I remember that album, my cousin had the cassette for it for 1984. And uh, 
Like mm-hmm. being like seeing the baby smoking and just being like, oh my god, this is so, this is so. <laughs> I, I remember just this feeling. It's probably the first memory I have of thinking something was like really edgy. Like, oh my god, right. it's it's it, it's just it, that's just wrong. I can't believe yeah, they yeah. did that. And then you know, like seeing the albums that would be coming out by the time uh, you know like Two Live Crew was coming out, it was <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Didn't even yeah, register. <laughs> And somehow it seemed edgier than the the nun smoking on, uh, you know, the Sabbath album or something, which is really yeah. weird, right? It's like it shouldn't be, but like somehow with the ba- having the baby with the angel wings smoking out. Yeah. Well, if, at least they were, you know, they were of legal age, probably. Exactly. Know. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what about you, John? What's your memories of Van Halen growing up? Uh, you know, it's it's actually kind of similar to um, to Greg's because. Um, um, I remember the the 1984 album uh, as well, uh, being that and and yours too. You know that that being the first one because that was probably around the time like 1984 album. What were we, what were we Nate? Around like like eight or nine? Yeah, something like or that. You might have been a little younger, but um, yeah, yeah, I remember you, yes. the 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 cassette of it and seeing the jump video. And I had those same impressions too. It was weird because they were like in this it wasn't a live concert video. It was like the studio video and right. uh, he was playing keyboards and stuff. I didn't know anything about Eddie Van Halen. It was just a really catchy song. And I had my little uh, Walkman and everything. And I would like, uh, you know, uh, re- record it off the radio on my boom box and listen to it um, amongst like uh, just a bunch of other songs. But that was the first one that I had uh, kind of heard like the single. And um, I was never um, after that. I mean, it was never really the biggest uh, Van Halen fan, uh, to be honest, just kind of a casual um, fan or follower, um, what have you. But uh, that was uh, that was pretty much my. I think like a lot of people, like in our kind of generation, probably the same entry point. Um, but since then, I have gone back and done the like from first album to last album, like listen to all of them through because I actually never have until maybe mm-hmm. like five years ago or something like that like never really listened to them and um i was actually really kind of impressed by how kind of avant-garde and unusual some of the songs are especially in the early albums like i wasn't expecting a lot of what i heard yeah they're they're great and i remember what we talked in our um difficult to cure episode about the early video like they won an award for this video and it was just basically like a it was like every other rainbow video it was like them on stage really kind mm-hmm. of stiffly playing a song and then they cut interspersed some like war footage and they won like a video award at can for this and right. it's like you guys have really taken it to another level you're uh, you like edited something into it and that was 1981 and then you go to right. like um i remember that was is it the yankee rose video with a yeah. convenience store and the entry like that yeah. i remember yeah. seeing that on mtv and it's it was so like you know it was very uh animated the way that they they filmed the the, the intro and they uh, you know it was, it was done in a really comical way and david yeah. Lee roth with the crazy makeup on and this was only a few years later but they had re- like videos that came so, oh yeah so far in such a short amount of time yeah oh yeah i mean if you think about it what was the the rainbow video uh, that won the award 81 uh, it can't happen Seven? here i think yeah it was 81 was it, yeah. was it 81 yeah, yeah. And, and mtv was 80, was 81. It, <laughs> it was probably was it yeah brand so new, right yeah so those those um when you think about it those early videos were really um such a new medium that people like even filmmakers i didn't think really know knew what to do with them so you know, like you look back now and like they're you know people giving awards or praise to these early videos and you look at them now and it's just like the infancy of anything you're just kind of like Ugh. <laughs> you know, compared to what came out even five or ten years later when they got more conceptual like the like the early 90s videos that um that we grew up with um you know we we're in our teens and everything like any everything from like the like the the Aerosmith videos from like uh, from Pump and Get a Grip to the the uh, Guns N' Roses Terminator Two video, like all that stuff was so slow oh, yeah, together, wow. and um, you know, and then that's kind of where it took off to. So when you see those early videos, sometimes you're just like, where do they come up with these concepts? Yes, yeah. the one that just comes to mind too. Speaking, of, we were we were talking about White Snake is uh, is slow and easy. You know, we have like the intercuts with. Uh, the, the woman's neck with the necklace and you're yeah. like, well, you know, what's going on? Are they arguing? Are they fighting? What, you know, why is David so angry? He's got a beautiful woman and he's in a rock band. He shouldn't be so mad, you know? And then, but you know, obviously 
that was like the kind of the 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 beginnings of the, the performance footage cut with the the, uh, the narrative stuff that you're not quite fully understanding and you're thinking did the director not want me to understand does he want me to think about this and watch this 10 times or is it just like is it not put together in a way that made it clear what it was but yeah like obviously yeah. like three four years later it's like you're saying like the david lee roth videos and even like scorpions rocky like a hurricane with the big cage and everything it's just sort of a the, just the whole production level and the sort yeah. of conception of what a video could be it's really even within a year or two it seemed like there was like big leaps where directors were kind of getting the getting the uh um kind of the ambition or sort of the sense that we're going to take this and really try to do some more and more with these little three or four minute films or whatever they mm -hmm. are you know yeah and when, in Deep Purple, they really didn't do any videos until, well, obviously in the early 70s, they didn't do any. But um, when they came back with Perfect Strangers, you've got that Perfect Strangers video yeah. where it's just them sitting at a table laughing and then them playing soccer and <laughs> just like they just didn't know what to do yet. They, they yeah, it was more of a promotional out. video for the band than it was a music video. Yeah, and you probably get the impression the band, they were like, we have to make a video and the band's like, well, we're just going to hang out if you want to film it and stitch something together. <laughs> That's on you. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing anything different so <laughs> yeah. feel free to follow us around the camera yeah just, just don't get too just close let you know we're not we're not helping you at all just don't get too close to richie with the cameras and everything will probably be fine <laughs> oh yeah right right you want to smash like <laughs> yeah R richie was probably the the uh the the forerunner of that movement like listen we ain't doing nothing <laughs> yeah, exactly <That's laughs> all right <usually> <laughs> usually his take um so uh, i i guess that that kind of like um what that makes me think of now i'm probably a good segue um uh, Greg is um, um, most people that uh, like myself before you know, Nate actually made me aware of it a few episodes ago is what is the correlation between Van Halen and Deep Purple because on the surface there really doesn't seem to be one they're two really different bands yeah I mean I think what's interesting is that when I got going on doing the research for Van Halen Rising I got to talk to a lot of people who grew up with the band meaning that they were basically like the same age as the Van Halen brothers or David Lee Roth, either went to high school with those guys or hauled gear for them, uh, shared gigs with them. And I'd ask them like, what songs did those guys play? And if you think about the era, it makes perfect sense. The brothers first started playing as a power trio around 1970, 71. And really that was, you know, when they were really starting to, to do this thing where what they would do is they would get records and they would imitate they would basically learn records note for note at the time, uh, you know, by slowing either slowing down the records from 33 to the, the half speed. So Eddie could learn the solos, they would learn the solos and they would, that was kind of what the Van Halen brothers were known for, even before they had David Lee Roth, um, for being the guys who could play the first side of the Who Live at Leeds all the way through note for note. They would do these at backyard parties. And, uh, you know, when I, when I talked to people, they would talk about this, period of time also it's really interesting where they had a keyboard player for about a year they had an organist and that was when they started they was, guys were doing a lot of deep purple a lot of stuff from in rock uh you know kind of smoke on the water kind of the stuff you would expect but there was this whole era where the brothers um and then later with david lee roth were playing back their parties and kind of first trying to get into thinking about doing nightclubs where they were actually kind of taking that um direction you know they play things like the zombies like other stuff you could imagine that would be sort of uh, keyboard ask stuff that you could do with organ a lot, a lot of that stuff was popular at the time but yeah the uh and the the other of course very interesting thing to me is the, the the influence of eddie van halen's uh the richie blackmore influence on eddie van halen first so so i would i would probably suggest that there's probably not a lot of lines you could draw between um uh, deep purple riffs necessarily or deep purple um song structure and Van Halen albums, but I think you could hear sort of the the, uh, the pieces of some of Blackmore's playing in Eddie's Eddie's stuff. But to be sure, um, you know that the, the uh, one of the guys who was in Van Halen before early on, um, the bass player was named Mark Stone. Said they used to play a ton of stuff from In Rock. They played they played a ton of Deep Purple. That was one of their their definitely go to things. Which again makes sense if you think about the era seventy two seventy three. That would have been some of the most popular stuff, um, you know, in an, any American high school. So uh, that was right up their their fans' alley, but yeah, the uh, the the, uh, the few songs that two survived is bootlegs too. There's some stuff that's um, maybe Emma Leo and a few other things that are kicking around on YouTube. You can hear some recordings of them with Ross singing that stuff, which is interesting too. 
Yeah, and I've got some. Uh, I, I've got quite a few of them too that we could uh, we could definitely get into in a little bit. Um, there's the um, the story, the famous story of of uh, Eddie Van Halen meeting Richie Blackmore for the first time. Um, <laughs> I've got a quote of uh, I've got a quote from Eddie. Uh, what's what What's your take on that first meeting between the the two of them? So this is supposedly the one that happened at the Rainbow with John Bonham. Is that the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here's the thing. I think um, I've never met Eddie Van Halen, so I'm kind of only going on my impressions of him based on writing books and such. You know, but I get the impression that he is a guy who on some level, and I don't mean this to be a criticism, it's not, you know, he's not a, a super outgoing or super secure guy, meaning that he's not like a big eomaniac running around like I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. And so I could imagine if he's approaching Ricky, Richie Blackmore and that, you know, Blackmore treats him like that, that, that would be like a real, like he wouldn't be like, well, F that guy. He'd be like, actually, I don't want to say wounded by it, but actually really like, it really affected him. And I think it would affect anybody, honestly. But, um, you know, but I think like David Lee Roth, for example, like if like, you know, Robert Plant insulted David Lee Roth, he would be like, you know, oh, I'm a better singer anyway, like, walk away. <laughs> like, you know, he would like, he'd probably believe it. He'd be like, I'm a better frontman anyway. I, you know, we don't have a record deal yet. It doesn't matter. I, the chicks like me more, whatever. He would like, walk yeah. off. you know what I mean? Even, even like uh, 1974, he would have said exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm being like pretty serious about that. Like, I think there's like something to that, but um, you know, that, uh, that also kind of, I think, fueled, Eddie Van Halen's um, drive, those types of things, those types of moments. He seems like the type of guy who, you know, um, you know, maybe like the Michael Jordan esque where, you know, you know, someone didn't acknowledge you the right way. So you have this like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna show these people. And I think that was one of the things sort of on some level for him, like he really internalized those types of moments and was really, you know, was really uh kind of determined later on to kind of um I don't know, I just sort of really deliver, you know, and and show that he was the next big guy in the scene. I don't mean like he was doing it to show up black one necessarily, but I think he really was kind of like, fuck these guys, you know, basically like I'm gonna, you know, on some level, like I'm better on some level, you know, that I feel like I'm a better player and I'm gonna show them, um, you know, even if I'm not a super outgoing, confident guy, if that makes sense. Hopefully I'm trying to make sense of that sort of like, you know, in a guitar playing, yes, but sort of like on a personal level, he's, you know, he's not a, he's not an alpha. I don't think Eddie, Eddie Van Halen's an alpha by any stretch of the imagination in terms of how he approaches personal interactions, you know? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I've got a, a, a great quote from Eddie Van Halen. This is from Guitar Player in 1979. Eddie says, it's funny, there's two types of guitarists. Like Blackmore I used to hate because I met him once at the Rainbow with John Bonham when we were just playing clubs. You know, I grew up on him too. And I ran over and said, hello. And they both just looked at me and said, who are you? Fuck off. <laughs> and it pissed me off. And to this day, I remember that. And then just recently, Rainbow played at Long Breach Arena. This is right after I won the best guitarist, yeah. uh, which would have been in the magazine uh, reader's poll which I'm really honored, makes me feel good. I went down there in a way with a vengeance, you know? I just felt like saying, hey, motherfucker, remember me? About three years ago when you treated me like shit, but I yeah, didn't. Yeah. I just said hello, and he knew me just through my records and radio, and he complimented me. So kind of that does back up the persona you were talking about, which, which is just kind of like, okay, well. You know, the other thing is that I was told, and um, hopefully I'm not jumping the, jumping the gun here with this story, is that... Um, you know, I was told by more than one person that Blackmore saw Eddie play in, a cl in the clubs, Bef you know, maybe around the time Van Halen was signed in 77 or right before Van Halen was signed, that Blackmore actually came, heard, heard about this guitar player and came and watched him play, uh, which is interesting that, uh, and I, 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 my understanding is that Eddie knew that, that Eddie knew that Blackmore saw him play. And again, I don't know how that, that corresponds with the rainbow incident, which may have been before that, but, um, you know, Blackmore was definitely was aware, I think even before, before Eddie made a record, that's the way the story was told to me. This was when the, this was when they were playing clubs in you know, Los Angeles before they went on the road, before Van Halen one came out that, uh, that Blackmore sat down and either the, either the Starwood or the whiskey, it's in, it's in Van Halen rising and actually sat and just watched him play. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. And I think, the other thing, too, is that if you read, and I'm sure you guys have read a lot of these interviews, later on, people would ask Blackmore about Eddie. And pretty typically, he would have something 
generic but but good to say like oh he's he's a very good guitar player or i really like his playing or something just you know not fawning over him but just you know he, he never seemed to be uh for however he treated eddie initially he never seemed to be um kind of taking shots at him like some other guys would take shots at him but this is the other thing that's interesting that i, w- I thought i'd bring up is that you know there were, he, eddie talked about this quite a bit that that guys he felt fell into two categories or were like the neil sean guys who were sort of uh, um, amazed by Eddie, but for whatever reason, didn't feel threatened by him, but sort of like, we're like, hey, we can, let's be friends and kind of like, we're, we're cool to him. But then there was like the Joe Perry and the Richie Blackmore, who he felt initially snubbed, whatever, like, you know, Blackmore snubbed him before they were famous. But, but um, from what I understand, Joe Perry snubbed them when they were um, on the first world tour, like, you know, uh, he approached Joe Perry, wanted to say hello to this, you know, basically, I grew up on your records, we played your songs, and Perry was just basically like, you know, fuck, yeah, exactly, who, who are you, get out of here, or something like that, and he was really pretty upset about that, um, so, yeah, it's interesting, I mean, I think for uh, Carl Blackmore's famous moodiness, I mean, he didn't, from what I've never seen, maybe you guys have seen him, I've never seen anything where he was kind of, you know, basically, you know, taking shots at Eddie, right, you know, or it had, you know, damning with faint praise or anything like that. I think from what I've seen of Blackmore, he never really overtly takes shots at people. Like he'll say kind of these little backhanded things. Or right. He'll say like he's, <laughs> he's made these offhanded comments about Satriani and being, you know, like he, he'll admit, oh, he's a great player. He's such a great player, but he's, I mean, there's something missing from his passion. He's never searching for notes. He'll always say things oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, I've seen that quote before. Well, you know, you could just see, like, Satriani right. being – even though Satriani, I don't think anyone would disagree, is te- technically on a different level than Blackmore, on a technical level. Um, right. I think almost anyone could agree on that. But Satriani is – Blackmore is a hero of Satriani, so you know that's got a sting. Right. When he, when he right. says something like that. And, right, right you know I, I i don't know how much of it is just sour grapes like i you know i was for a long time widely regarded as one of the if not the best guitarist around and now this new wave comes in who does things that i don't even understand really what they're doing you know and eddie, eddie kind of fits in that it was one of the yeah. first at least one of the first mainstream people like that who could who just played things and you're like what the hell is he even doing right mm-hmm. right and that yeah, could the, have been that could have been a big reason for it is um, uh, the competition element, uh, jealousy between players. Yeah, so. for sure. You know, and, and it, yeah, that's what I was I was just going to to touch on too. It's interesting because if you read like Black, he says in an interview, Eddie, that you know I grew up on Blackmore. There's a couple of interviews that were done, kind of before Van Halen broke. So it would be basically like the first couple of weeks of the Van Halen first tour. So they're out with Journey. They're kind of a new band. They haven't gotten to be a big band like they would by the end of 1978 where they'd been a broken big. And and uh, Steve Rosen, who you guys I'm sure know the name, did work, great work for uh, Guitar Player Magazine, later Guitar for the Practicing Musician, interviewed everybody. Um, he interviewed Eddie, again, pretty early on, like, you know, uh, just weeks into the first world tour. And uh, he asked Eddie who his influences were, who he liked. And he mentioned Blackmore, he mentioned Jeff Beck. And, you know, interestingly enough, as time went on, he stopped really talking about those guys and he would just talk about Clapton. Who Clapton was always his idol. And I always wonder if part of that was that, and again, I don't know what his relationship was with Beck early on, but he sort of felt like, why should I be like, you know, he, I think he, there, he would, you would hear him say like, all these guys hate me. They all hate me. You know, like I, I didn't do anything to them and they all hate me. And I think at some point he stopped mentioning them as influences because he just didn't want to give them the satisfaction right just basically you know not to sort of like i'm hiding my influences which i initially i kind of thought maybe that's what it was but i think more of it's just like you know this guy wasn't nice to me why should i go in a guitar magazine and say i like richie blackmore's playing when richie blackmore wouldn't talk to me you know or, or whatever um but the they have the whole influence thing there it's it's interesting with of course with like you said with satriani as well it's like yeah it's gotta you know it's always got a sting when your hero or you're one of your your big influences it's kind of like, yeah, you're okay. You know, something like that. Yeah, it's like, so. Yeah, it's like, I, I hesitate to make a sports analogy because I'm a complete idiot when it comes to sports, but it's just like, <laughs> you know, if you see, you know, if you put like the, the bottom of the barrel team together from like the absolute, you know, worst performers of, uh, of a major league team now and put them against a team from the 50s, I mean, it would, it would be a, a right. they would destroy the other team. Like, it's, 
it's so much has evolved. You, you, you stand on the backs of all the people that got you to this point sure. and learn more and take it to the next level that, you know, like putting, you know, the, the guitar God of 1950, whoever that was, put them, you know, in a room with pick, pick your average shredder. And they, that, that guy from the fifties right. wouldn't even know what, what right. to make of what he was right. hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting stuff. And I, I can't imagine it, it had to have been difficult for Eddie Van Halen, who like when I was growing up was, he was the guitar God, uh, that everyone knew like in mainstream, sure. he was, you know, he's playing on Michael Jackson songs. Everyone knew who he was. And, uh, to, to, to get to that level and then just kind of feel like, oh, even the people that I worship, I'm like tech technically better than them. And just kind of it must have been kind of a lonely feeling almost like being shunned almost by the people that you really admired yeah i mean i think i think over time that probably i don't know for sure but my my gut is that like a lot of those guys like initially were kind of like yeah just another whatever another guy who plays a lot of notes kind of like really started to realize how amazing he was especially after this you know with the songs i mean i think that's the thing when we talk about deep purple talk about rainbow i mean the thing that make those albums sustain maybe on like some of the Ingbe catalog, for example, was that the songs are really, I mean, sorry, did I take an, take an unkind shot at Ingbe? No, I, I love, no, that's um, fine. <laughs> I love a lot of the early, I love a lot, in the first two Ingbe records particularly, but um, you know, it's just the, the songs. I think that's part of what, you know, sort of for, I think a lot of people probably sold them on Eddie Van Halen. It's like, wow, you know, this guy's written, you know, three, four albums worth it, you know, initially from the six albums and on and on of these, these songs that are really, the people like. And, um, you know, he was like Pete Townsend, Eddie Van Halen, we're going to work together. And I think probably over time, a lot of that sort of like initial, like cold shoulder stuff he got, but he, he talked about that quite a bit on the 78 tour. And there were other people, um, I can't remember who the other guitar players were, but you know, um, who, you know, basically were just what were, he, he just sort of like naively walked up to him and be like, Hey man, I like, you know, I want to meet you. And they were just like, yeah, whatever. We don't care. You're the opening actor. We don't, you know, whatever. So yeah, imagine having Eddie Van Halen as your opening act. If you're like, you, you think you're a, a hot shot guitar player and you see this young band, you don't know anything about him. Like, right, oh, man. like Pat Travers or someone like that. I mean, that's yeah. honestly like, if you think about it, that's like, the, the that actually happened more than yeah. once. And I, I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong, I like Pat Travers as much as the next guy, but like, it had to be like, that type of stuff had to be like, oh shit. Those guys <laughs> had to be like, oh shit, right? I mean, it's like, even guys like Nugent. I mean, that's the other thing that's really kind of funny is that um, I guess Nugent, I know that Van Halen opened for Ted Nugent at least twice in 1978. And I guess uh, Nugent, Eddie got, got along fine that Nugent was respectful to him and talked to him and stuff like that. But um, I, the, the great story is that Nugent had Eddie come on stage during, or Nugent showed up when Van Halen was sound checking and he was like, give me your guitar kid. Like he like tried to put it on. He's like, I want to you know, how do you make those weird sounds? And Eddie was like, what do you mean? He's like, you know, like, and then Nugent, kind of, you know, he's like, it just, you know, it just like that whole, thing where it's like he kind of realized oh it's not like a bunch of tricks it's actually <laughs> eddie there's or nothing, something like that there's no uh, strange thing inside of it it's a, right um, exactly. like a few years yeah. ago there was a uh, a, a scandal uh, uh, during the tour de france there was like somebody put in a really good time so they took the bike apart because they thought there was a motor inside there <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 like, yeah <laughs> like there's got to be something magical about this yeah. about this instrument that's making these sounds mm-hmm. yeah yeah, Nugent was, uh, but, you know, again, I think, you know, Nugent probably fell in that other category where he, for whatever reason, probably was like, whatever, didn't feel super threatened or whatever. He, he was the Nuge, right? He's like, who can be threatened? I'm the Nuge, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Same type of thing. I have a loincloth and I swing on a rope, so how could you, anyone, anyone top me? Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was the same, you know, that same type of situation where they're sort of like, oh, you know, this is something, this is something special. Um, if you were going to acknowledge it, it was definitely a game changer. Well, yeah, if you, if you come at it from the, the, the period when it was happening, he was doing stuff that was so innovative and different. At the time. If you think of it now, it, it's not innovative and different because we've heard it for the past, what, 40 years. But back then, I think a lot of, like you guys were saying before, a lot of the older school guitar players, like uh, they, they were just like, ah, what is this noise? You know, like grandparents or something like that. Like, ah, that's just noise because they didn't, they, you've never heard anything like it before. So you yeah. probably have half the people like that and the other people like, like Ted Nugent who were really uh, inquisitive and they, they, they were just like, wow, what is this crazy sound? Whereas like somebody like, you know, uh, if it was, I don't know, Ricky Nelson, his head might've exploded because <laughs> <laughs> all he knew how to play was like chords or something. I don't know. Yeah, I think the the thing with uh, 
very the similarities between Blackmore and and Eddie are are that they're both so inventive in what they're playing. Like I can listen, I can watch anybody shred and be impressed for like a a brief duration, and after five to ten minutes, I'll be like, okay, I'm bored now. But with Van Halen and Blackmore, the thing that makes them really interesting is that they're the the melodic element in their solos and the way that yes. they, they improvise Definitely. is so interesting. Definitely. But then not only that, but both of them are exceptional rhythm players and come up with amazing riffs and interesting ways of playing things. They're not like, you, like you said, they're not just strumming chords. They're doing, you know, even just figuring out what Van Halen or Blackmore are doing in the rhythm section of a song is hard enough. Never mind <laughs> the solo part of it, but like, what do you, you watch their hands and you're like, they're not making normal you know they're not just doing bar chords and things things you can easily figure out they're 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 constantly and the fact that they're so strong that they can play with just them and being backed up by a uh, you know with no rhythm guitar or anything and still sound that full is mm. incredible mm. um but that being said uh we've got uh some early like we talked about and we teased some early bootlegs of Van Halen covering some Deep Purple song. Or Deep so I've Purple. heard this stuff like quite a bit. So I'd be really interested to in hear what you guys think. It's sort of like, you know, like the fresher ears of this, mm -hmm. of this uh, Van Halen bootleg uh, Deep Purple connection. Oh, for sure. So this first one is um, like you brought up earlier, Maybe I'm a Leo. And this is off of uh, wow. the, the Gazari's Dance Party uh, bootleg. Mm -hmm. And this is from 1974. Sounds about right. Yeah, it's about right. It says February 1974, and parts of it are from 1975. But here we go is uh, Maybe I'm a Leo. Obviously, the sound quality is a little, wow. a little rough, but but listen how tight they are. You can kind of hear how loud the guitar is too. Yeah. And I like the little harmony that must be uh, Michael Anthony doing the yeah. harmony behind him, and it that. It makes it sound like it's a Van Halen song, just the way that they're harmonizing. Yeah, that's really, really interesting because this is it. it God, even the way they're they're playing, it doesn't it doesn't even sound like a Deep Purple song. It sounds like a Van Halen song. That's and kind of the classic really the classic comment that Eddie Van Halen would always make. That he would say that. Uh, so, as a cover band, at this era, one of the things that were uh, was attractive about it, any band playing covers was that you sounded like the record and these they would not get some of these gigs because the owners of clubs would be like that doesn't sound anything like that you know it doesn't sound anything like steely dan you know it sounds like we basically sounds like van halen playing a steely dan song or whatever so but yeah they're definitely putting their own stamp on it yeah Definitely channeling a little Blackmore there for sure. Definitely. But no, no whammy bar. So this would have been probably, probably his less gold top, less Paul he had at the time, or he had around this time. It's a short version. This is less than three minutes long, but uh, really. Really impressive. <laughs> it's cool. A really, a really nice. quick little in and out version there. It's it's awesome. And I just yeah, I really love like that that. Yeah. that backing on the uh, with uh, when they're singing together there. That's just it transports me to thinking about Van Halen more so than Deep Purple. So I, I tell you guys a funny, interesting story is that, uh, so I interviewed 
Mike Anthony for Van Halen Rising. And as advertised, he was such a sweetheart, great guy to talk to. It was just, you know, growing up as a fan, you're like, oh, I'm talking to a guy from Van Halen. He was just so cool to me. Um, but, you know, someone I, who, one of the people I interviewed for Van Halen Rising was that, uh, observed to me that, you know, Mike Anthony, before he joined Van Halen, was the lead singer in his own group, which was called Snake. And so Mike used to sing ZZ Top. He did all of this stuff as the, you know, playing bass in his power trio band. He had it for his own. And uh, so a couple people said to me, like, oh, when Mike joined, we thought, oh, it's going to be like a Coverdale, uh, Glenn Hughes thing. Mike has the high voice. <laughs> Roth is more, whatever. Roth is more of a, diff a diff had a different type of, uh, you know, a vocal to vocals than, uh, than uh, Roth. And uh, I asked, really asked Mike Anthony that, and he laughed. And he laughed only because he goes, yeah, Dave wouldn't have gone for that. I mean, I don't think he laughed because he thought it was like an insane idea that I was suggesting, like, because I think he would have liked, I think, I personally think that Mike, Mike enjoyed singing lead on some songs and probably would have, wouldn't have minded doing that. But he was like, yeah, Dave was, basically he said in so many words, Ross Ego never was going to allow <laughs> that type of like, oh, here, and here's the bass player is going to sing a song. But um, <laughs> they could have done that. I mean, they did, you know, they did do on a couple of covers you guys can check out and people can check out on YouTube. Uh, they did Beer Drinkers and Hellraisers by uh, ZZ Top, and they did the dual vocals thing later on, you know, in the 80s, which was really cool. But uh, yeah, he's got a great voice. And like you said, that's sort of the one of the signature things is the, the Mike Anthony vocals mm -hmm. there with Eddie in the background. They really make those songs sound like Van Halen. Yeah, oh, it would yeah, be interesting definitely. to see what would happen. It was because, like, Coverdale comes in as a virtual unknown and, and, and shares uh, duties with Glenn Hughes. Yeah, and yeah. then you've got Roth as a relative unknown. Well, they were, I guess they all were relative unknowns, but completely already at that ego level where he's like, no, nope, I'm not. Yeah, I'm that's not why, well, I think that's why he, I mean, that's why he laughed. He was just like, you know, it was like, no way <laughs> that he like, even like, yeah, Dave was going to, was going to let that happen. But um, I got a better yeah, idea. I mean, you can, he, he can be uh, Roger Glover with no mic and uh, I will be Ian Gillen. <laughs> he, de he definitely fulfilled his role though in putting his stamp on Van Halen songs because you hear a lot of oh, people yeah. talking about uh, anytime they talk about Van Halen, like right after they mention Eddie, they just meant they they always mention uh, Michael Anthony's background vocals being like a signature stamp um, on the records, even yeah. to the point where on um, on uh, Roth's uh, last tour um, opening for uh, Kiss. They uh, there was speculation as to uh, and it, it, you could hear it because I saw um, uh, one of the shows. Did they have his whole background vocals piped in? It's like absolutely because there's no way those guys sounded just like him. right. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean yeah. that's how signature it was. It's right. like if you wanted the song to really sound authentic or get right. that feel, then there's only one guy totally. that can provide that voice. Totally. Absolutely. Um, speaking of Coverdale and Hughes, uh, the, here's something from the Mark III era. Might just take your life from the same uh, bootleg. Wow. And we we've listened to one of the songs from this bootleg before on one of on a previous episode, but um, we just kind of yeah, which, at the, which we song was to, it? Um, well, the next one that we can talk about it, which is the grind from uh, Tommy Bolin. Uh, oh, okay. they, they did the grind, so, um, so let's let's listen to uh, Might Just Take Your Life and and see how see how they handle that Mark. Well, III I'm excited flavor. for this one, yeah. I already like it. <laughs> it's great to, you know, just cover that intro with the guitar and it still sounds great. Great drums. Oh, yeah. It's a shame that instead of like the kink songs and stuff, they didn't cover these on their earlier albums. <laughs> exactly. Ted Templeman. What did you do? His rhythm playing is so good. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Just imagine, uh, 
Wow. <laughs> they do it really good. Yeah. Imagine if this this was a better quality bootleg. I mean, it's not bad for a bootleg, but. Yeah, but God, I mean, gems like this make you want to like wish that there was a cleaned up version you could listen to, right? Oh yeah. And bass playing able... is really good too. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's doing awesome. They're all killing right it. And then you you, you got to figure there's a whole part of this that's missing which is the organ and you don't even notice because Eddie's right. just all over the place covering everything <laughs> wow they do that part so well <laughs> he didn't give that one over to Mike like you said <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's like let's you know. I'll take this one Let's too. Let's get crazy, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll take these. Kind of hear too how Mike's vocals like overwhelm Roth's uh, yeah. on the backgrounds, and it's interesting because uh, when I interviewed Ted Templeman for the book, he talked about how he would he when they would do background vocals on the Van Halen records, Ted would sing sometimes at backgrounds yep. with Eddie, to, and he would double Eddie's vocal because he said like Mike's vocal was like. So like huge that you had to like try to make the harmony right. You had to have you had to basically double up Eddie's just because of just you know it wasn't that Eddie wasn't a good a good singer. It was just like to make it sound equivalent, we would yeah. double Eddie's voice <laughs> and just use the one track of Mike singing to make the harmonies. So yeah, you can really hear that how like you know it might just take your life. It's like like is Roth even singing? You can't hear. It. Yeah, a lot of power in his voice. Yeah, that was really that was really cool. I enjoyed that. I mean, I. I think they did like a, a Mark III cover. Oh no! Yeah, it's it's pretty incredible too. Because I mean, I don't know what it was like uh, in you know 1974 in the clubs, uh, but we talk a lot on the show about how Mark III and four basically are completely ignored in America. Uh, you just we you know we didn't we we talk about how we we learned about them through you know hearing white snake and then just being like wait david coverdale was in deep purple when was that yeah, and try and then right. you were working backwards from there just based mm -hmm. on when we kind of we grew up it was it was you never hear them on the radio you never hear any of those songs so i don't i, I wonder what it was like at the time were they playing that uh, because they liked it or because it would have been popular to play at parties in 1974 i don't know the stuff like that i'm very very confident that was driven by the brothers i mean mike i'm sure like roth didn't mind doing it and like that mike liked doing it but like the brothers were very uh into that exact type of like you know what i would call like um i don't know what you call it early 70s sort of um, heavy metal i mean much more than roth would be so like they love for example the other thing that brothers loved was captain beyond mm -hmm. um like all that stuff from uh raging river of fear they used to play all that stuff from that from the the early captain beyond records too and so that stuff wow. was the stuff that roth was and it's all in van hill rise but basically that roth was like eh, you know this stuff really is not very chick friendly that's what roth would say like basically it's like not <laughs> really <true>. like <laughs> and so you know this is kind of like the compromise where they would do like twist and shout and they would do motown songs and then you know they would be playing uh you know five sets at Bizarre's five 45 minute sets so they would do these do this the other sort of like the more i guess palatable for a basically for a club setting type of deep purple like we're not going to do like 
we're not going to do Speed King, but we'll do Might Just Take Your Life because that could kind of like, you know, you could kind of kind of dance that, I guess, in theory, mm-hmm. um, if you're in a club. So yeah, the uh, but that was not Roth's f- forte. He didn't really enjoy that type of, of music. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's to have them doing some stuff burn, just, you know, they were, you know, they were really were, the brothers were really, um, really locked in on that, that type of, that was what they, they loved, that type of hard rock. Yeah, they, and they did it so well. Yeah. Um, one of the last uh, uh, ones on this, on this particular recording is uh, one that we played, just a brief snippet of it before, but it's them covering Tommy Bolin, uh, the grind off of uh, Teaser. And uh, here we go. I feel like that's really a style you don't hear Eddie Van Halen playing a lot. Sounds really kind of bluesy. And again, it's hard to get myself in the in the mindset, but Tommy Bolin is not someone outside of our circle I've ever mentioned that people would say, "Oh yeah, I know who Tommy Bolin is." So great being, job a deep, this being a be, being a Deep Purple fan was was he um, was he also a fan of uh, a big fan of Bolin? You know, I, I always thought a lot of the Echoplex stuff that Eddie did on Eruption, like live, especially a lot of that stuff, and and then um, you know the the stuff uh, the Quadrant Four stuff with Bolin. I always mm-hmm. thought that solo, in my personal opinion, that Eddie definitely heard that. Definitely, I know they. I mean, they must. They know they heard that, and. If you, I always thought that solo, in particular with the whammy bar stuff, like the slurs, you know, the sort of uh, and the the uh, the whole approach to that solo seemed very Eddie Van Halen to me. I, but I've never heard Eddie talk about or read an interview where Eddie's like, "Oh, you got Tommy Bolin." But I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, here you go. He, he was aware of who he was. You know, he would have had to be an early influence. Well, the Quadrant Four, I mean, for me, was always the was always the blueprint for Hopper Teacher. May not be the only blueprint, but it's pretty, that. yeah, definitely. That makes sense, yeah. Well, Jan Hammer doing the, the keyboard stuff is the tapping and the drum intro and everything, you know. Um, you know, it just was sort of, you know, I think the the, insp- the inspiration for it, I would, I would think, one, or definitely one of the inspirations for it, so. Well, you got to think if he was a fan of Deep Purple too, then if, if they didn't, if they were around at this time and didn't even put out their first album until 78, then he was aware of all the lineups until they, they, they kind of ended it in 76. So, but maybe Bolin wasn't as much of an influence to him. Well, as, somebody as told they, me they, that the, Eddie for sure, and I think Alex too went to see Deep Purple at uh, Long Beach Arena, and this would have been 74-ish, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I don't, I don't know what, what lineup that would have been, 73, 74. You guys maybe know better than I would. Uh, yeah. Mark, Mark, Mark uh, three, right, Nate? Mark three. Yeah, I, I, I would think. think. Well, I know there's a, there's a good Long Beach Arena show that they did in 75, but I think it was with Blackmore, so it would have been probably early, like January or something. Yeah, I mean, they were definitely were big, big oh, fans. There's, the, the, the one I'm thinking of is 76, I'm sorry, so it would have been uh, Bowling. So, um, so it's so funny too like you know when you really when you listen to van halen bootlegs from 10 years later and it's gonna be you know this is not exactly rocket science on my part but like this the crowds are so loud oh, <laughs> like, yeah. always in these bootlegs it's always like well then you know and there's like nobody clapping and it's like people just kind right of like, and ross <laughs> like hey we're gonna take a pause for the cause we'll be back in five or whatever like and he like leave you know they leave or whatever yeah it's just like interesting like you know there's like 20 people yeah. standing around and half of them aren't paying attention it's just a different different vibe but yeah that's a great mm. great version of that song do you think david david lee roth always looked out and saw like at least ten thousand people like no matter yeah i mean i think <laughs> you know um you know a lot of people have that level of confidence but he yeah he made it happen um i this one of the great stories i was told for the the book is that i talked to mark kendall a great white great guy and uh he grew up seeing van halen in backyards and then 
then would go see them in clubs. And he, so he, in 1976 or so, he was at this bar, biker bar, Kendall was, and he like, he had talked to Roth a couple of times, like, you know, hello. And like he sat, Roth was kind of sitting by himself and he came up to him and he's like, hey, I'm just trying to get my band started. Like Mike, Mark Kendall's like, what do you do? He's like, well, man, pretty much I get up in the morning, I get on the horn, I start calling the club. Like he like did this whole like feel like he was like the man, like basically like Mark Kendall said it was like, seemed totally un- like unfake. Like it was like, this is like, he was like, but Ken, the way Kendall was fantastic. Like he was just like, yeah, man, I'm, you know, we're just on the horn, you know, making calls and making deals or whatever. Like, you know, yeah, that's how we do it. You know what I mean? Like, like Kendall was like, okay, like, taking notes. Like, okay, got it. You know, I guess wow. it worked. I guess he took the right notes. But yeah, he, uh, I think that was always part of Ross, Ross, uh, Ross Dick. I mean, the other one great story is that uh, kind of a deep purple Dio twice removed is that uh, one of the great stories that uh, Tracy G told me of, uh, of Dio, um, told me that he he saw Roth in a club and uh, uh, Tracy was like 16 or 15 mm-hmm. and he was like oh man like he stopped you know it basically was during a soundtrack and, and Roth was leaving stage and he stopped him there was not many no one around really and he was like oh man your guitar player is amazing he's like yeah kid he is you know he's like, <laughs> he is. And he's like how did he get so good he goes well let me tell you how it works kid First thing he does when he wakes up in the morning, he puts on his guitar and he starts practicing. <laughs> eating breakfast, he's playing guitar. Eating lunch, playing. I mean, like at, Tracy will tell you that for himself. Like, and Tracy does a lot better than I do. But like, he was like, "Oh shit!" You know, he's like, "Oh wow!" You know, like you know, Roth was just a, a, a guy in the club scene, but it was already like, you know, he already had to knew how to like, you know, make his guitar player into like this larger than, uh, you know, be, be, make him into a star before he's a star. Right? He's already like projecting yeah. that. Like Eddie's a star because he worked harder than everyone else, man. You know, get used to it. We're gonna be here. You know, like that's that's what those guys told me. Oh, it's kind of a, a different right. vein with like we talk about Coverdale a lot about just basically if he hadn't been a singer, he would have just been super successful doing something because he's yeah. he's got that charisma Char- level charm, where totally, yeah, the charm, like he, he not maybe that 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 sort of super serious ego side that Roth has, but. No matter what Coverdale was thrown into, he would have. And same thing right. with Roth. I'm sure he just would have. He would have had the the best used car sale, you oh, know, the car lot in California definitely. or whatever. It definitely, was. definitely, like the biggest chain of fast food restaurants in the yeah. country. It would have like, you know, and come on he, down to Dave's Burgers. You know, they're like they're all the commercials. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah, you've got to you've got to admire that. And obviously, there's you know not belittling either of those guys' talent no. behind it, but. Uh, it's just, it's funny to see. <laughs> um, so I do have, uh, you know, a few more. You, well, you, for, before we go on to those, though, you had brought up a track that you said off of Van Halen 2 that w- that you believed was uh, very influenced by Deep Purple. Yeah, it's in my ears. Hear what you guys think. So which which uh, track is it? Uh, uh, Light Up the Sky. Light Up the Sky. Let's take a listen. So the riff, for sure, I think. Very highway star. Yeah. Get a little loud, fast breakers coming out of the gates, taking chances with a crash and burn. And there is a way the beauty, but you never get love. Cross the line with none return. I watch my television, almost lost my mind. It said, Open your eyes, be there, or be I am the wind, the wind. Did you hear Eddie? operating on that guitar like the same way you hear Blackmore just sitting back yeah. and playing these riffs and these rhythm lines with that precision. Maybe Man on the Silver Mountain, I would think, maybe.
have a, a good friend of mine that used to give me guitar lessons and stuff, and he's a phenomenal guitar player. He would be listening to uh, these early Van Halen albums quite a bit, and it takes me back to driving around with him. And his brother also played drums, so they kind of like a Van Halen, mm, a Van Halen combo, driving around in his Camaro listening to this album. I mean, to the solo to me, has that a little bit of that Blackmore feel to it. You know, it's like one of those like sort of like baked into the cake with Eddie. Yeah, and he's he's such a good player and so such an original that you can hear those influences, but nothing right. ever sounds derivative. Right, never. Right, you're never like, oh, he's stealing this from something. Nobody. Yeah, you can't. I can't really put my finger on it, but I can hear that influence in there. Not like. Even like the the verse, there's kind of a um, there's kind of that highway star feel to it, but it's not a rip off of the riff. No, it's just kind of reminiscent. It makes you feel it. But and even like the the bridge kind of had some Richie with the uh, the, sounded like some finger picking in there. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought that was probably the most out of anything from early Van Halen. I always thought it was the most again reminiscent in some sort of way like i was like okay like you know if you were to say like what riff was sort of a deep purple-esque that verse riff that you know da, 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 that that whole part in there um but uh yeah and also maybe some of the like the, the pull-offs the, the blackmore-esque pull-offs in the middle of the solo but you know again it's like like we're all saying it's not as if it's like that was an eddie van helen you know cloning blackmore and you know, it's just not like that it's yeah. just more of just sort of that yeah, that, that feel, that vibe to some of the some of the licks and stuff like that was sort of like you could hear how that may have been from playing, you know, Deep Purple songs for six to seven years in his clubs. Mm. Sure. That it just kind of naturally seeped into his vocabulary, almost um, his musical vocabulary. Was there um, is there any other uh, kind of um, maybe not a whole song, but moments um, in other songs that you've ever picked out? that kind of uh, make you think Deep Purple or Blackmore uh, specifically? You know, you know, not really. I mean, I think the thing I was going to bring up, which isn't exactly on this track, was that I always thought it was interesting that, you know, what happened with Van Halen was that before they were famous, as I mentioned, they were, they were much more into sort of a proggy sort of style of metal, and they became sort of streamlined into this much more commercial thing, which is actually what happened with, with Blackmore too, which, of course, Blackmore was famous the whole time, was that, you know, Rainbow... You know, honestly, like the stuff with, that Rainbow was doing and the stuff that Van Halen was doing was not completely, to me, out of, you know, out of, uh, um, out of uh, connection with each other in terms of that same sort of, you know, where, where Blackmore decided to take things to a much more commercial sort of uh, level. But, you know, going back to your original point about, about that, you know, I, I, I don't really, you know, there was nothing else that really ever came to mind to me going, that sound, sound is like a deep, like a deep purple uh thing i mean i think again like we talked about the bolin I mean, the bolin influence i definitely think that there was um you know with with some of the eddie soloing i think he probably could have taken some of that stuff from tommy bolin but yeah you know much more on the on um you know just i think eddie's sort of the even like with eruptions just sort of the general classical feel i never thought like oh he's ripping off blackmore riffs but i could see how like the blackmore application of classical music to rock music would have would have been something that definitely would have would have uh, obviously been central to, uh, to on Eddie's radar. If you're, if you learn any deep purple songs, that's gonna that's gonna come up, obviously. Mm-hmm. So obviously, we spent most of the time talking about Blackmore and and Van Halen or Eddie Van Halen. What about the other um, the other three in Van Halen or this this incarnation of Van Halen? What, what were their main influences coming from? Um, with with Alex, you mean Alex, Mike, and. And Dave, um, yeah. mm-hmm. well, we'll start with Dave. I think with with Dave, if you read his biography and sort of look at what he has talked about over the years, I mean, he was definitely somebody who would, would have come much more out of, um, you know, the, the Motown genre in terms of what he liked. He, he had ended up going to a high school that was really quite integrated. And I, this was the time of... Um, as Roth would put it, integrational busing, where as a white kid, he was being bused across town to a, uh, a different area of town to go to a school called John Muir High School, which was heavily Latino, actually uh, some Asian and black. And so, you know, Roth always talked about how that sort of shaped his, his musical vocabulary. He, you know, he went from going to a school where like, you know, 
um, kids were listening to, to Black Sabbath, like the Van Halen Brothers, where at this other high school, it was like Santana or, you know, or, um, you know, other groups that were much more, you know, I mean, like, for lack of a better term, ethnically diverse in terms of how they, they approach things. So, you know, when, when he came into to Van Halen, I mean, you know, obviously he was familiar with like Led Zeppelin and all this stuff, but he talked about how the brothers wanted to do Grand Funk Railroad. <laughs> He's like, and his, his biography is actually, which I really would recommend people pick up and find. It's out of print, which is kind of bizarre, but it's called Crazy from the Heat. And he talks about how we did, you know, we did Grand Funk. It was a disaster. You know, basically, like, they basically, he tried to sing the Deep Purple, the Black Sabbath, the Captain Beyond, the Grand Funk, all the stuff the brothers wanted to do. And he just was like this, you know, it just it didn't work for him. And so they had to kind of find that happy, find the songs that would work for him, happy medium. Again, I could imagine, I don't know this for a fact, but like, let's do Highway Star. And Dave couldn't, couldn't do it. He couldn't hit the screams. He couldn't do the, sing the vocals. And it was just like, you know, he's talking about how like the whole set was just like a, a, a troll, total train wreck. And that continued as, as until they evolved into sort of finding the way to get it together. Um, you know, Mike Anthony, in terms of what he's talked about, um, ZZ Top, Humble Pie, I think very much um, uh, a lot of that early blues, blues rock that would have like Zeppelin and that type of stuff that would have been, um, would have been, uh, popular at the time and as I mentioned you know he was he was fronting his own own band and doing whole you know basically whole sets with him um doing lead vocals and playing and playing bass so you know in terms of in terms of the the meeting there with the Van Halens they actually the the story which is a great one is that Snake Mike Anthony's band opened up for Van Halen at a at Pasadena High School and Van Halen's PA went down and blew up and Mike Anthony loaned the PA to the, to the, you know, loans his PA system to the Van Halen. And suddenly um, they sort of strike up a friendship and they ended up replacing the bass player they had at the time with Mike Anthony. Um, you know, Alex, for, uh, Ginger Baker, but, you know, I think Ian Pace as well, uh, Carmen Apice, those would be, the, I think, his, his guys. He also liked like, Louis Belson and some of the earlier, the jazz big band guys that, that he would have um, certainly been... Uh, familiar with since he was younger because his father was the Van Halen father was a jazz musician but um I always thought yeah Carmen Apice, John Bonham for sure uh and and the other guys I mentioned Bonham in particular is interesting as well as that uh you know Alex later in later years would always grumble and I you know hey he's it's his his records and I understand you know if he didn't like what he was hearing but he always wanted a bigger drum sound he was one of that Bonham-esque drum sound and eventually what they do is they hire Andy Johns the uh, engineer producer to do for him off of corner knowledge because Alice really wanted to get that big, huge, the Zeppelin S drum sound. And he finally, you know, he finally went to the guy to get it. So um, yeah, those would have been the, been the influences, but Roth was definitely the guy who had much more of the pop sensibility. And I really tried to lay out in Van Halen Rising the argument that Roth was the guy who was like, you know, it's really cool that you guys can play a seven minute cap and beyond song note for note. Um, that's like amazing. That's really cool and everything, but girls hate that and you can't play that in a nightclub and we can't make any money it didn't that. work for captain beyond so how's it gonna no, work for Van Halen? i mean the, the, the other great captain beyond story is that uh there's a there's a bootleg recording of them doing um captain beyond which is starting to make the rounds and i had heard this story before <laughs> so, and my friend uh, who's a friend of mine in Los Angeles who's older than me and grew up on those records. So he's, he's in his early 60s. And he was like, he heard it and he's like, that's not right. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, the song's not right. And I, I said, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not following you. And he's like, when you listen to the way Van Halen does it, they do everything no for no, but there's this one part that isn't right. And I ended oh, yeah. up talking to the bass player from Van Halen before Mike Anthony got in the band. And he said that the, the copy of the record they <laughs> had had a skip oh <laughs> and so that was the only version they had it so they did like there was part of the record skipped and they just made up like a different like they made up like a three second four second like thing to kind of cover where the skip was so they had to, like you know push, basically push the needle forward because there was a skip i mean that's but that's how how much those guys were into learning that stuff like dead on note for no um well, captain you know, beyond had a lot of weird time signature things yeah. so they could have thought right and that, again that's the stuff the brothers you know and that that really served those guys well later because they were so the brothers were so locked in and able to do this very you know, this this honestly pretty sophisticated rhythm stuff on uh, a lot of the Van Halen's the fair warning, a lot of stuff you listen to is pretty it's pretty sophisticated, but that was the stuff that Roth was like, Yeah, let's not let's not do that anymore. Um, let's try to, you know, do top forty. And that's 
Roth was the one who really pushed those guys to start to do go to the clubs instead of playing in backyards where you could do honestly, right. You're, you're in the backyard. You can do the second side of, um, of uh, Sabbath volume four. People love it, you know, but you can't do that in a, in a nightclub where people are coming mm -hmm. to dance. The, the, uh, the story. A, it's, it's been true. <laughs> it's true. One of the funniest uh, stories in the book to me is the, uh, about how, it just seemed like like Roth was just always pushing to be in the band and they just were not having it at all. They're yeah. just like, hey, buzz off. Like we're not interested. Yeah. And then basically he had a, a PA and they start renting it from him. And then they just make this business decision. Like, listen, we could save a ton of money if we let him in the band. <laughs> we don't have to rent his PA anymore. <laughs> and it sounds so comical, like something you'd just see in a, in a comedy movie. But here it is, like a real story of how – they let this guy into the band and obviously he be, ends up becoming, you could make the argument. I think that they wouldn't have launched if it hadn't been for him yeah. making these de decisions, like you just said about playing the songs that are going to get the girls in the club or, you know, and even more so than that, just songs that people want to listen to. Like, like I said, as a joke, but it's serious. Like captain beyond didn't really take off with their own stuff. So right. why would Van Halen have taken off doing right. their material? Yeah, and just real, real quick, I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like, it's, the other thing is that Eddie Van Halen was singing at the time. And, it, you know, and I, and I think when the brothers are a little bit more kind about it, they kind of will admit that, like, yeah, Eddie wasn't very much of a singer, and it was hard for him to play guitar and sing at the same time. And, like, you know, they, they basically, they knew on some level they needed someone like Roth. And, like, he may not have been perfect. They might have thought he was a weirdo, and his singing wasn't that great. But ultimately... <laughs> you know, he could do the job as a front man. Like, you know, he, he definitely had the confidence, the vibe. He, he could pull the sort of like all of the things that would go along with being a front man. He had it maybe, you know, without like the perfect, he wasn't like, you know, he wasn't Paul Rogers. That's the thing. Like, that's why they were like, he, you know, he couldn't sing. Well, you know, that was kind of the, I think the template, like those guys were like Ian Gillen, Paul Rogers, you go down the line of all these great singers. And then you have David Lee Roth, who was like, not like that, but yeah, I mean, you know, beyond the PA, which is which is totally true. They always talk about the PA, the PA, the PA. But you know, they you know they really when they're more honest about it, they're like, we needed him to kind of step in to to fill the fill what we needed, which was that we we couldn't pull this off anymore with Eddie singing all the time because Eddie couldn't sing. Either. I mean, that's the thing that's always ironic to me. They're always like, Dave couldn't sing, and I'm always like, well, uh, fact check, Ed can't sing really either. I mean, he can sing background, <laughs> so he's not he's not a lead singer. I mean, right? No, you know. I can't sing either, but I'm, you know, he's not a lead singer. He's not able to capable of fronting mm -hmm. a band. Yeah. I have the lead singer persona and that's, what's going to get it. Exactly. I mean, it's, exactly. It, it's like, you could be the best business. Well, you could, you could have the best product in the world, but if you're not a salesperson, you're not a salesperson. And he was the sales mm -hmm. guy Absolutely. come in and I'm going to sell the band. I'm going to have the charisma. I'm going to front it. And well, you know, where else you hear, you hear that, uh, that same story. If you jump ahead to the eighties was the Motley Crue story. You know, how many times have you heard that, um, hey, Vince Neil wasn't much of a singer, but he looked great. The girls loved him. He was, uh, you know, yeah. he was a great front man. And, you know, it's that was, you know, that's along kind of the same lines It's like some bands just, um, you know, they, they got somebody with the, the charisma to be out front. And that's what really, you know, helped catapult them. And even if they're not conventional singers, I mean, you know, like meaning convict, like, you know, Vince was not, he's not Joe, uh, Steve Perry, but I, I mean that. They're distinctive. I mean, that's the thing is like, hmm. even Roth was distinctive. Even probably yeah. it has his, when you hear him even singing these bootlegs, you're like, oh, the singing is not great, but it's distinct. It's like, you're like, oh, it's sort of unusual. He doesn't sound like some sort of generic, like guy who like, can just sing great. Who's just like a, like a Broadway singer. Like you could have a mm -hmm. hundred Broadway singers we could line up who have these amazing voices, but you know, there may be none of them that are really memorable at all. They're just sort of like these perfect voices. Whereas Roth is sort of has like this, like, like Vince has this sort of, un, you know, uh, unique sound to the voice that's sort of like oh that's a little that's that's kind of memorable yeah yeah and roth always ha growing up listening to the music and l listening to that studio cut after we listened to a few bootlegs you're just like well easy enough to clean up in the studio sounded great yeah uh, you know maybe maybe live he's he's able to cover for it any of his deficiencies live just by his personality so absolutely so speaking of uh, Ross vocals, we do have a couple of uh, Deep Purple offshoots here, like the previously hinted at Man on the Silver Mountain. So we've heard we've heard Roth sing Gillen. We've heard him sing Coverdale and Hughes. We, are we ready we to hear him sing Dio? 
Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> this is this this is a tall tall order to fill. A perfect. All right. I don't know. Yeah. A perfect. See if you can pull it off. Here we I'm, go. Dave's pretty confident. I'm 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 gonna back, I'm gonna back Roth on this. He's confident. <laughs> Here we this go. should be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's like you fell off a cliff there. <laughs> it's <in> my hands. <laughs> ah! <laughs> to me, it's more like kind of seems like he doesn't know the words. Anthony come wow. in there you're just like maybe they should have just given him this one yes I I never in my life thought I would hear David Lee Roth sing Dio I think it's it really to me like yeah you could say whatever you want about the vocal performance but it, he doesn't know the words no. <laughs> it's the main no. problem it's, uh, well, I mean, it's really interesting, too. yeah. And that's my point. Like, he doesn't, he didn't like this stuff. Right. right. This was like the brothers going, all right, we're doing six Motown tunes. We're going to do Rainbow. We're doing Rainbow. And he's like, all right. You know, like, you had to, like, compromise. Right. And I've, I've been in bands before where we're like, hey, we're going to cover this song. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> and, you know, when your heart's not in it, it's hard to fake. Well, yeah. I mean, you can obviously tell that this is not Dave's wheelhouse. <laughs> no. Like, he's just not really into it. It doesn't suit him. Listen to that. <laughs> and he's just going off. Yeah, yeah the brothers are like... And like Alex is like pounding his drums, like doing all these little solos and everything, little fills. Wow. And to be the fair, guitar. too, if, if, if you've been playing at some of these like smaller clubs and stuff, I can't tell you how many times I played at a club and I could not hear anything. You know, I couldn't hear anything I was singing. I couldn't hear anything I was playing. So, in Roth's defense, right. this is not a Madison Square Garden. They don't have a monitor set up for, probably that for anything. And he could have been going into a lot of this not even hearing himself. But, so here's but, my great... Go ahead. Um, still, I think that when you hear the other Deep Purple songs and then you hear this Rainbow song, I think the kind of the, the flavor that Richie had in this song was really not suited to the type of band that these guys were would become. Yeah. Yeah. So here's my grade. I want to tell you the, the, the Tracy G story. So I I, um, I did a, I had Tracy. Tracy had, has a very good memory. He's like, you know what? I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. And I just like took this all in because it was like so incredibly exciting to me as a kid to see this. It was just incredible to see this guitar player in this band. And I wanted to be in a band like this. And I was, you know, lucky enough to be able to go and see these guys. And so, you know, you know, fast forward years later, he's working with Ronnie and uh, they were playing, man. He, Tracy told me that they were playing, rehearsing Man on the Silver Mountain. <laughs> and he mentioned it to Ronnie. He said, you know, Van Halen used to play this song. He's like, what? Like, Ronnie was like incredulous. He's like, what? Dave can't <laughs> sing that. Dave couldn't have sung that. And he actually, like, you know, Ronnie kind of went off on that. Like, like you know, he's basically going, that's, that's, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And, like, he's like, well, they tuned it, you know, he tuned down, like, I, you know, whatever, Ron, you know, Tracy, as a guitar player, was explaining to Ronnie, they played it, whatever, they, they, they either tuned the guitar down or they played it in a different key or whatever. And, like, but I guess, like, Tracy was just like, like, Ronnie, Ronnie didn't hear this song, but he, like, 
already was like <laughs> he's already offended that's, that's exactly that's, that is the dumbest thing i've ever heard what were they thinking like I, you should, guys should have tracy tell you that story because he tells it a million times better than me but it's like oh. it was like i was like oh shit i was like poor dave i was like poor dave like ronnie james Dio was like trashing him and like you haven't even heard the tape maybe he did it great ronnie how do you know you know yeah oh, i love ronnie but uh yeah tracy tracy yeah uh, tracy said he just was like yeah he's like you know chuckling telling me that story <laughs> that's great <laughs> well we do have one more i do have the captain beyond song if you want to if you want to listen to that sure. oh god yeah so it's oh another... geez uh david lee roth doing a uh, rod yeah so we've got no. so that'll that covers everybody that covers all the all the deep purple singers right <laughs> we've got gillen evans mm-hmm. blackmore uh, blackmore yeah coverdale hughes Tommy Bolin, even he sung on a mm-hmm. Deep Purple song. So there you go. That's all the. Uh, oh, Joel and Turner is the only one missing. Yeah, JLT. Yeah, the only one. Does, does he do a JLT? <laughs> Any JLT? Graham Bonnet. They didn't get it in the cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if we go into all the uh, offshoots here. All right, let's listen to uh, let's listen to this. This is uh, Van Halen doing Captain Beyond. banging out that instrumental for sure. <laughs> nice. This was done at Pasadena High School. Yeah, this is the, the yeah, the auditorium the, uh, the auditorium. Actually, it sounds pretty cool. Really good, actually. <laughs> he's actually, it sounds like he's doing a, an, a Rod Evans impression. Yeah. Well, I figure out of all the vocalists that he could emulate or do their material, Rod would have been probably the easiest because he had the, the least amount of, uh, like, range. Like, he didn't really go super high or do anything really complex. Yeah, right in Roth's range. And this, so this was with their original bassist, Mark Stone. Right, so, right. And so you'll notice that right, you don't hear the, the, the mic, you know, any, any Michael Anthony at all. So I'll put a link to this one in the show notes as well. The, the the quality is obviously a little rough, but you can tell that, I mean, instrumentally, they're killing it. How old would they have been at this point? Uh, 22, I think, 20. Eddie, let me think, that's, is that right? No, actually younger than that, I think. Wait a minute. Uh, um, 20, 20, 21, probably. Eddie was probably 21 at the time, I think. Someone, someone, someone will come in and correct me in the show, in the comments. Like, yeah, wrong. they always do. He's best twenty-one. <laughs> I can't believe you guys got that wrong. <laughs> um, Oops. But... So this is actually the gig that Mike Anthony opened for. That oh, basically okay. Van Snake opened. This is exa- the exact gig. But this is maybe not... you guys can hear where the skip is. Or the skip in the record where they they made the part up. Man, I mean that's we not. Must, we must have missed it. No, <laughs> it's. <laughs> As he said, what are you saying, kids? <laughs> wow, that's yeah. Neat. And they were like, what do you mean? I graduated you last year from John Muir High School, man. What's your deal? 
We were in the same study hall together. Exactly. <laughs> like, like, like a year ago. What's your problem, man? <laughs> but wow, they're, uh, I mean, that they're incredibly tight on that song. And like I said, yeah, it's, that, that's a very, that's not a, an easy song to cover. It's not like, but you know, not let's do knock it on heaven's door and you got it down no. in, in, in 10 minutes. It's that's, that's a very intricate. Song. And that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what the, like I mentioned, the brothers kind of made their bones or reputation about being able to do this stuff. You're like, you know, stoned at a party. And you're like, are they really doing like a whole, <laughs> you know, a whole suite from captain beyond like really? Yeah, they are. Um, and the bass player they had Mark stone, was really, really a very, very good. I mean, I always tell people, obviously, he was with the brothers for three and a half years and kept up with them from the very beginning. Um, you know, he brought Eddie and Alex the first Black Sabbath record, like showed that to him the import, the vertigo, like, like check this out. You know, he was really kind of locked in with those guys, and they they uh, ended up, um, you know, moving on from him and, and letting Mike in the band. But um, he, they were, yeah, they were very musically. Those guys were really, really tight. Um, you know, and then Roth is like you said, that's actually probably was one of the rock who's like okay if we're going to tackle one of them you know one of that sort of genre of stuff like that type of stuff it's probably um a good one for him to do for sure all right so we got um before we wrap up we do have a few other things i mean i got uh, you know you've seen i'm sure you've seen these videos of van halen playing some blackmore riffs and stuff and oh that um, yeah and that's you know that to me when i saw that I, I was like, there you go. Like, you know, if there was ever any doubt, it's like, he's like, oh, has that go? Oh, yeah. And he's like playing, you know, it's like he, they, he would learn those, that stuff note for note off the records and they'd play it, you know. So it's like not surprising that he, like, 30 years later, he's like, 25 years later, he's like, oh, here, or 20 years later, whatever it was. And so here's, here's, a, here's one of uh, him backstage playing, uh, let's see, where is it? Here we go. Here, backstage playing some riffs. Let's see. Nice. It's not like us. It's just like power ridge. And it's, 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 it's like one of my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you know who he's playing with here? Uh, so the band is Baby Animals, I think. They were oh. a band that opened up for Van Halen in 88. I think 88, I think it was. I think. He's just like talking with such passion. He's like, oh, you gotta check this song. You gotta see this riff. I'll put a link to that in the show notes too. It's a, I mean, it's a really short video. And there's another one too of him backstage playing. And that's how you, you know, the passion with these musicians, they're, they're playing all day. They're in the studio, they're playing shows and then backstage, what are they doing? They're playing, you know, <laughs> just playing songs and rehearsing them and, and turning uh, another or, or talking to another musician about these great parts of these songs. Oh, you gotta check this out. It's, it's really cool seeing that stuff. There's another really cool part of that video, which I like to, point to people is that uh is that uh there's a um, i don't know if it's before or after that clip but there's he's sitting down backstage he's at sound check with baby animals and he puts on a telecaster and he starts playing um lead boots by jeff beck and it's not his guitar it's not his rig and it yeah. sounds exactly exactly like jeff beck it's wow. like you know you realize these guys with you know, then that level of Blackmore, Van Halen, Iomi, they had like these unusually just the, the, the sort of level of talent in their hands that you couldn't even dream of as guitar players. It's like, oh yeah, I can make this sound exactly like, just by however yeah. I, you know, it's incredible. I, I, I'll put a link to that one in the show notes too. That one's a little longer. It's almost like six minutes long, but he does a few Deep Purple riffs and a few Deep Purple songs. And then he does, like you said, the Jeff Beck thing. And yeah, it's really impressive just to see someone who's such a, a master and knows so many songs just, like you said sit down with somebody else's instrument and 
And did you hear he compared in rock to Power Ridge by right? He's like, you know, he was mm -hmm. like talking and he's like, they were like, well, he's like, what, you know, what album was like? And someone may have said it in rock or he couldn't remember. He's like, it's just like Power Ridge, man. And I think he means like, it's just like one great riff after another. Like, that's yeah. what he's saying. Like, because he, yeah. he always talks about how ACDC's Power Ridge is, is his favorite album or his favorite, you know, hard rock album. And um, just kind of giving props to Blackmore there and those guys for like, you know, all these like, just great riffs all over the record. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's great stuff to see. And uh, I, I saw something in an interview recently that's, that said, Eddie was saying like, he, basically he doesn't listen to music. <laughs> like, yeah. did you see that recently? Like, what's that all about? All right. So here's the thing. Like, you know, um, I won't out the person who told me this, but uh, I have a friend who's a, you know, I think he's been saying that for a lot of years where he talk about how he just, you know, Eddie just listens Eddie would say, oh, I just listened to like Peter Gabriel So was the only album I listened to. So I have a friend who was a uh, musician who um, actually got to spend, uh, you know, some time with Eddie around 89 or 90. They were basically, this, his band was a, in LA rehearsing. At a rehearsal place, he met Eddie and got to do something socially with Eddie, kind of like bowling with him, like these bowling nights they would do in LA and kind of went to 5150 a couple of times and drove around with Eddie in his truck. And he said one of the tapes that Eddie had in his truck that he used to listen to was, was uh, Perfect Strangers. You know, I'm not saying that like that was the only tape he had in his truck, but like he remember particularly like Eddie would listen to Perfect Strangers by Deep Purple. So, you know, did Eddie ever talk about that? No, he like never would like, you know, he would like when people would ask him in interviews, like what guitarist do you like? He would, he would, you know, he would say like, oh, I like Brian Adams guitar player, which I think, you know, um, I forget what the guy's name is. Um, he's a great soloist. Like his solos are always great for the songs, but I always felt like that was his way of like avoiding having to do like the Ingve yeah satriani vi i mean he would you know he, he praised vi a couple of times and I'm not, I'm not trying to to be unkind to eddie i just think like you know at some point you probably just want to avoid that type of stuff because like no matter what you say yeah it could be read the wrong way like you know you know you end you, up like, in... say like he's better than me i admit it you know it's like you end up coming off as like a dick right so he would yeah. just try to avoid that so he never would talk about, i think that's part of like his strategy on some overt or subconscious level like i'm just gonna like i don't really listen to me <laughs> You take yeah, it for what I, it's worth. I mean, like, right? That, that's know. a good. That's a good uh, take on it because I, I thought that I saw that. I was like, "What do you mean you don't listen to music? That's impossible!" Like, who doesn't listen to music? But yeah, you say the wrong thing, and literally 15 minutes later, the headline on Blabbermouth: "You won't believe what right. Eddie Van Halen said about you know Phil." But Taylor the Swift, he's trashing Swift. He might like I like her songs, but I don't like the the yeah. genre. So it's like Eddie Van Halen trashes Taylor Swift or something. Hates whatever. Taylor like, yeah. Swift, right? Exactly. And I, you know, but I thought that was really interesting that um, my friend told me that, that that one of the tapes that Eddie had in his car was Perfect Strangers. No, that's awesome. I'm glad he's uh. His truck. It was a truck. Yeah. He's still he's still keeping it keeping it alive. So, well, awesome. Well really want to thank you once again for coming on the show uh um, it was my pleasure again really this, enjoyed it. this this the van halen book is awesome and i'm uh i'm like i said i didn't know a heck of a lot of about van halen uh, and learned so much from this book and i am definitely going to look into picking up the ted templeman book because like i said your writing style having read so many rock and roll books a lot of them are you know just you know thrown together or maybe you know self-published and you know minimal research and not necessarily bad but this is on a different level with the how much uh how much you put into it and it's not just like one quote after another after another after another and there's well, thanks some, appreciate there's that. some people that do it really well and uh i hope this is just the start of the of, of you going down this road and and continuing to write books in this vein because it's it's fantastic i appreciate that i just will make a little joke here everyone knows it's a joke like tomorrow on blabbermouth deep purple podcast <laughs> crashes every rock biography <laughs> except greg Reynolds, which is the greatest ever or they might just say we're trashing yours who knows <laughs> exactly oh, man, exactly they would love it if we were on blabbermouth love uh, it oh god <laughs> Like, what do we, not, we have to, not, what, yeah, what can we do to get a blabbermouth exactly? Yeah, I've got to say, if they mentioned us at all, I know like, uh, like Mitch, La someone. <laughs> Mitch LaFon is always like very like, uh, I've heard him say it a few times where he's just like, hey, blabbermouth, if, if they say something that I said, I don't care what they're saying. It's free, exactly. it's free publicity. <laughs> It'll be on every, you know, I got, I can't avoid blabbermouth. Like every day it's coming at me and every angle I try, I try even trying to avoid it. So 
No, yeah, usually it's, it's me. Like I'll send you like an article, and he'll and Nate will just text me back like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> just it doesn't matter. It's like, ugh, platform. Because it's almost, it's just one of those things. It's comical. Like, it's so funny. I, I don't want to be like all clickbait is bad, but like, if if you go to a site ten times in a row and every single time you're disappointed by the headline <laughs> that drew you in, then you, you at a certain point you just say, I'm not going to waste my time anymore. You know. Oh. <laughs> They had one recently. It was like Ozzy's. Uh, it was like Ozzy family reveals horrible medical diagnosis, and you're like, "What's going?" On? And I actually, I was I, against my better judgment. I clicked it. <laughs> I was like, "What's going on? Is Ozzy okay?" And it was about Shannon Doherty, and it's like, not that it's not bad, but I'm like, "What does this have to do with anything?" It was them talking about Shannon Doherty's cancer diagnosis, and it's like, talk about being misleading. Wow. That's probably one of the <laughs> worst ones I've heard. Jeez. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's terrible. And I, I, I feel horrible for her and her family, but uh, sure. you know, it, it was clearly me meant to say, we want you to think Ozzy's dying. Click the link. There's another, and there's another whole, uh, I won't even give the names of those, but um, you guys may have seen this. You have news alerts set up for any band. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll come up. And it's always like, you know, it's like, uh, Wolfgang Van Halen reveals terrible, terrible troubles. Then you like click on it, and it's like he's like it's like a picture on Instagram of you know of Wolfie like you know like getting the wrong drink order, like wrong lemonade from like Whataburger. I mean, I'm serious. It's like it's like and you're like it's just like it's just like you know like whatever Instagram posted is they just find a headline to put around it. It's like yeah. you know you're like oh Van Halen news. What's going on with Wolfie? And you're like oh it's just like his Instagram and like yeah his just, luggage like, got lost at the airport. Exactly, oh my God. exactly. <laughs> right, Wolfie, Wolfie Van Halen faces you know faces crisis in Chicago. You're like oh shit, <laughs> is he touring? <laughs> like, what's going on? Is he gonna be okay? On? Exactly. I always, mean, yeah. always disappointing. Every single oh time. yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know we're ready for like you know i'm ready for always like you know exciting news from bands i love but yeah, yeah like you're, yeah yeah it's it's pretty much always disappointing yeah, yeah one it's of those like, sites could, like, they could literally post like you know like lead singer of deep purple dies and I'd be like yeah right i'm not clicking that yeah you're right, right. yeah <laughs> and it's it's like it's not like dies of, of embarrassment yeah. because something <laughs> happened you're like ah they, they got me again <laughs> It'll be like, and it'll be the one time I'm just like, no, Nate, you should have clicked on it. It's true. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, no. <laughs> the one time. Oh. I know. Right? I didn't know for 36 hours this big thing happened because I wouldn't click on the link. <laughs> I refuse to believe it. Oh, oh boy. So, so, um, so speaking of uh, social media outlets, uh, Greg, is there any, any uh, social media outlets our, our listeners could uh, find you on that you wanted them to know about? Yeah, you can find me interacting with the Deep Purple Podcast on Twitter. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always uh, going back and forth about whatever inane, inane Deep Purple and White Snake uh, factoids we can talk about. But uh, yeah, Twitter is probably the best. I'm at Greg Redoff. Uh, I'm on Facebook. People can find me there too. But I'm most active on um, on uh, Twitter for sure, right. as you guys are as well. Which is my segue to you guys here. <laughs> yeah, we are. Nate, as well. Nate a little bit more than me. I'm. Nate a little. <laughs> I can't tell who it is behind the mask. It's just like I see the big logo and I'm like, it's like corporate, you know, you know, is it the yeah, intern? Like, Do you guys have like interns, like some 22 year old is like, you know, like. Yeah, that's our, for that's our uh, Twitter staff that does all those posts. I, I never Twitter. see them. <laughs> the tw <laughs> yeah, the, that's it. The, next, the, 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 uh, the Patreon money is going there next. So. It's like, yeah, like, exactly. a, it's like <laughs> a political campaign. You have like a media team, like four or five people like brainstorm, like, you know, like they drafts on your tweets before you send them and stuff like that. You guys are really really sophisticated yeah, I get like the, five or six interns who pay them about 50 to sixty thousand dollars each a year i want to make sure uh, they're all well taken care of uh. <laughs> all right well greg thank you so much for uh coming by our show we really appreciate it, it was a blast oh, it was great it was a lot of fun all, great all fun thank you guys so much really appreciate it anytime thanks a lot <laughs> all right have a great yeah, one thank you, you. Guys. bye thank you for listening to the deep purple podcast if you like what you hear and would like more episodes in the future, please donate on Patreon to support the show. You can also give us a rating on iTunes to help new people discover the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for show updates. See deeppurplepodcast.com for more details. Thank you for listening.